Salutations! This is the second part in our series about Radar Stealth. Check out the first video and the link below this video. Now let us go back to the 1950s. There was a problem then. Early warning radars became ubiquitous, they were everywhere, warning about incoming planes from hundreds of kilometers away. Since the element of surprise is probably the single most decisive thing in warfare, a solution had to be found. A solution that would bring radar stealth to warfare. Stealthy fighter jets can not only hide but also jam the opponent's radar. The jammer can create a fake radar return and trick the opponent, masking the real location of the fighter jet. A similar principle can be applied to your personal data usage. Imagine you're on a holiday abroad, you want to access your Netflix account, but you're in a different country and the content is not the same. You then use a virtual private network, like NordVPN, which is sponsoring this video. Check out their offer below. Through NordVPN, you connect to the internet via a server in a country of your choice and then access content, be it a streaming service or any website. You don't want your search history to be accessible or your texts and images being interceptable. NordVPN helps there too, encrypting your data. NordVPN is simple to use and is available on all of the leading platforms. You can have six connections at once with no bandwidth limits. Get 70% off the regular price and an additional month for free. Just go to nordvpn.com slash binkov and use the coupon code binkov. Check out the link below the video. Now back to explaining the Raider Stealth. Back in the 1950s, flying low was a temporary solution. An approach that was fine for two decades or so. But during that time, radars got even more plentiful. Now even small units had tactical radars and every half-decent anti-aircraft vehicle had a radar. Shoulder-launched anti-air missiles also became a thing. Gradually, it became unsafe to fly low when crossing over the front line. Another solution was needed. How about making the planes less visible on radar? Then they could go back high up, use less fuel, fly for longer and enjoy protection from all sorts of threats. Only it turned out to be pretty hard to give protection from all threats. Not all radars are the same. Radars send out electromagnetic waves. Upon hitting an object, those waves usually bounce away in various directions. If the angle of the plane's surface is perpendicular to the wave's trajectory, the wave will bounce back right to where it came from, in this case the radar. Basically most planes, even if they're not stealthy, will make most radar waves bounce away in all sorts of directions. But how they bounce away depends a lot on the radar's wave and on the plane being hit by it. Radar waves can be short before their waveform starts to repeat, if they're emitted by seekers inside missiles or small radars inside fighter jets' noses. Or their waveform can be quite long, if we're talking about ground-based large antennas. Now, interesting things happen if there's a discrepancy between the size of the parts on the plane and the size of the radar waveform. And it's not just one wave. Each scan emits numerous waves. At one moment some will hit the tail of the plane, at another they will hit the wing or the nose, or the missiles underneath the wing, or the engine inlet or various small objects around the plane, which are always present. Pitot tubes, sensor array, housing, etc. Let's take a large surveillance radar, for example, working in a VHF band. It creates waveforms 1 to 2 meters long. Those waves will not interact with the tiny features of the plane. Roughly speaking, anything that's less than one quarter the size of the waveform will not give out a return. It's like going over a surface with your fingers. The surface may appear smooth, feel-wise, but if one looks at it under the microscope, one can see that the surface is uneven, but the inconsistencies of the surface are too inconspicuous for your sense of touch to register. So if we take the VHF radar with a 1 to 2 meter wavelength, that radar would be blind to any protrusion or object in the plane that's 10 or 20 centimeters across. Pitot sensors, pylons from certain angles, various antennas, all those wouldn't really register. But wave resonance is a funny thing. When the size of a part on the plane begins to match the radar wavelength, the radar return not only goes up to a certain standard, it spikes up over it. Say the radar wavelength was 2 meters. That's how much a tail surface might be long. Or how much a bomb underneath the wing might be long. And at similar wave to size ratio, resonance will appear, driving the radar return to be almost 4 times as big as it would otherwise be. 
There's another reason why those long waves are better at detection. Short waves will, upon bouncing away from a curved surface, form a fairly precise narrow beam. A narrow beam is going to be detectable only from a fairly narrow area. As the waves get longer, that bounced away reflection will get wider. So even though it will also get weaker in the process, the overall area of the return will increase and thus chances that part of that returned radar wave will reach the enemy's radar will increase. Which is why those long wavelength radars can be quite useful for early detection of something, but not for identification. Curiously enough though, when we get to even shorter wavelengths of a centimeter or under, radars are sometimes able to pick up on stealth planes. At those wave sizes, tiny imperfections on the planes come into play and various bits can resonate with the radar waves. People will first think, oh the rivets are the culprits there. Those could ruin the stealth, yes, but decades of refining the production process have largely taken care of those. The culprits at that level of detail are various transitions from, say, edge of skin to edge of sensor cover, various dirt and scratches that accumulate on the plane, and perhaps most importantly, various panels on the plane. While planes have a lot of access panels for maintenance, most of those are sealed with radar absorbing materials after maintenance. But some panels can't be sealed the same way, as they have to open and close in flight. Landing gear doors, weapon bay doors, countermeasure panel doors, access to cockpit ladder doors, cockpit cover and so on. Those all have gaps which, while still treated so they have a lower return, still do result in some radar returns. Now, are those returns big? No, in fact, seekers in air-to-air -air missiles are still estimated to have much shorter range against stealthy jets than they would otherwise enjoy against regular jets. Let's say some generic missile has a realistic range of a few dozen kilometers, where the first half of that range would require outside guidance. It could be a radar in the fighter's nose or one on a ground-based anti-air system. It would send data to the missile and guide it, before the missile can lock onto the target with its own radar seeker. Comparing the expected figures of missile seekers against stealth and non-stealthy targets shows there's a big difference. It gives the stealthy plane a huge advantage to either turn away or to shoot first and possibly neutralize the threat before it gets in range to intercept it. Of course, in an air battle where both sides would use similar stealthy planes, overall distances of detection and the fight itself might shrink to basically near Vietnam era levels. That of course doesn't necessarily mean we'd see the return of dogfights. Miniature missile spams and laser defenses from said missiles might indeed be important aspects of air combat in the next few decades. The short waveforms have another problem. Some of those frequencies don't mesh well with the atmosphere and get soaked up by it, so it's impossible to attain longer ranges by using them. Plus, they're very power hungry compared to long wave radars, which is why they aren't being used on fire control radars, which do need longer distances. Besides the radar wavelengths that we talked about, radar returns depend on all sorts of various details when it comes to the shape of the plane. When radar waves hit the plane's surfaces, they not only bounce away, but also cause the electromagnetic current to follow that surface, depending on exact situation, angle, etc. Those currents then travel along the surface until they reach an edge, a gap or change of material. At that point, the currents are radiated once again in all directions as waves, so some of them will again go back to the radar. Sawtooth edges on various panels on stealth planes are positioned along the most expected axis, mostly from the front of the plane, so when radar waves hit those panel gaps, the reflected waves will go to the sides. That also applies to the induced radar waves that travel along the surface to the first gap. That gap also benefits from sawtooth edges. Of course, with incoming missiles, it's not always possible to make sure the sawtooth edges of landing gear or weapon bay doors will indeed align correctly towards the incoming missile. The newly emitted waves from the surface discontinuations also explain why the faceted plane approach, such as the F-117, was abandoned, and smoother plane surfaces are preferred. Again, that only goes so far. One example is the nose. A radar wave creeping along the surface can go all around the nose and dissipate energy in all directions, including a return to the radar. Chines on the nose help there, as the creeping wave will stop at the edge. The wave will scatter there, true, 
but being on the opposite side of the plane, the nose itself will block the return of the waves to the radar. The main reason of the chine is of course still to make the initial radar wave bounce off into other directions and not return to the radar. Basically any sharp point or an edge will cause the radar wave to scatter all around. Since those can't fully be avoided in plane design, materials that cover those edges come into play. Radar absorbing materials have for decades been part of the overall stealth equation, but have also for a long time been regarded as secondary. Indeed, one of the people who helped kickstart the F-117 stealth fighter back in the late 1970s was Dennis Overholzer, who then famously claimed, the four most important aspects of stealth are shape, shape, shape and materials. Of course, that was then. As we can see in changes to the design of newer planes, and especially with the F-35 looking less exotic and having all sorts of bumps sticking out, materials seem to be playing a larger and larger role in stealth. Perhaps today the claim should be shape, shape and materials and materials. Another hint to the importance of materials is again connected to the F-35. Back in 2005, the US Air Force made that famous claim, the F-22 has a radar cross-section of a metallic marble, while the F-35 has one of a metallic golf ball. But consider this, in 2005 the F-22 was a known quantity, having just entered active service. The F-35 did not even fully exist as a prototype. So that golf ball analogy was made as an estimate of a future value. Based on the X-35 demonstrator and various technologies projected to be available in the next decade. From then on we had puzzling quotes from US Air Force officials, back in 2014. When a US Air Force general said the F-35 actually had a smaller radar cross-section than the F-22. Now that claim lacks context, of course, it's possible, perhaps even likely, that it refers to performance against specific radar bands. As shorter waves would be easier to defeat with advances in radar absorbing materials than the longer waves would be. But other sources kept yielding some interesting news bits on development in radar absorbing materials. When they were used in 1960s spy planes, those materials started off as paint containing ferrite particles. Those particles would absorb part of the radar waves, transforming them into heat, and thus lower the radar return by an order of magnitude. Of course, that wasn't enough. The SR-71 saw the addition of plastic and glass fiber honeycomb structures, implemented where they mattered most, into fuselage chines and wing edges, as well as tails. The F-117 design saw a greater focus on the aircraft's shape as the use of computers in the design process allowed for the highest performing shapes against radar. But it too had sheets of ferrite materials covering the aluminum skin of the plane. The B-2 had novel materials for its edges. The glass fiber honeycomb structure was there, but it was filled with carbon. And it was done in such a way that the tip of the edge had the least carbon and the base near the aircraft's metallic surface had the most carbon. That resulted in the electrical impedance changing as the radar waves travel over and through the edge. The electrical current of the radar wave would thus not see an abrupt change, so there would be no re-emitting of said radar waves. Some of the raw materials use the radar wave against itself. The material can be one quarter thickness of the radar wavelength and then half of the energy that passes into the material gets reflected back once it hits the metallic skin. But due to the extra distance traveled, the wave coming from the RAM material will be out of phase with the original wave. The two waves will cancel each other out and no energy will get reflected back. While that sounds great, the issue of that approach is that the RAM thickness and structure needs to be tailored against a single radar wavelength, coming at a specific angle. In reality, that won't really happen, so the actual cancellation of the radar wave will be much less meaningful. Now all those are quite old techniques, but they show where some of the myths originated. Like the RAM materials needed to be one quarter the thickness of the radar wavelength, or that ferrite particles that RAM needs makes it heavy, and so on. In 2010, the lead official on the F-35 program mentioned a special conductive skin layer as the biggest technical breakthrough in the whole program. It included a non-directional weave, meaning its properties remained the same regardless of the angle at which radar waves hit it. And it was baked into the skin. It could be made as thick as desirable on select places around the plane. The thicker it was, the better it was. 
being baked into the skin of the plane made the maintenance easier. Older planes like the B-2 and the F-22 famously have to spend a lot of the time having their stealth skin maintained. So it is becoming obvious more modern RAM materials will be defining the next generation of stealth planes. Shaping the plane will have to go forward as well, of course. We're already seeing that some concepts for 6th generation fighters are trying to do away with tails. That would certainly lower the rate of return, but novel aircraft control technologies might be needed to retain maneuverability. Or a distinct possibility is that the next generation fighters won't even try to match the maneuverability of previous generations. Already there's talk of the next US Air Force fighter being a very large plane that will rely on energy weapons and missile defenses, rather than maneuvers in defensive combat. Stealth doesn't have a set future. The race between sensors and stealth continues, just as it goes on with armor and guns. Tanks didn't go extinct with guided missiles, so it's unlikely stealth planes will go extinct with novel sensors, for at least several more decades. Once again, for a more complete coverage of stealth, do check out our previous video on stealthy planes. The link is available below in the video description section. Oh, and before you go, think about subscribing if you like my content. If you want to be notified of my upcoming videos, subscribing is not enough. You also have to click that bell-shaped notification icon. And if you're viewing Binko on a phone, notifications from YouTube also need to be turned on. Well, that's it for now. Salutations! And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.